On the night of July 22nd, 1991, Milwaukee police finally discovered the horrendous secrets that Jeffrey Dahmer had been desperately hiding for many years. Acting on a tip from a young gay man who escaped from Dahmer's apartment, police searched number 213 and found a chamber of unimaginable horrors. Human heads and a heart wrapped and bagged in the freezer. Hands and feet at the bottom of his soup kettle. Skulls tucked away in a file cabinet. And this blue barrel stuffed with dismembered torsos soaking in acid. Dahmer would spend the next 24 hours confessing, telling in vivid detail of a murder spree that began in 1978 when he was 18 and ended with 17 young men dead. I had this reoccurring fantasy of uh of uh, meeting a hitchhiker on the road and uh, of taking him hostage and, and doing what I wanted. And uh, I never in my wildest nightmares thought that uh, it would become a reality. Why would Dahmer have, as he put it, created his own Holocaust? How did he become so filled with evil? It would be comforting to point to an abusive childhood, an early life filled with hatred or horror, but his was filled with love. Jeff was the most beautiful, darling, sweetest baby, the nicest young boy. There just were no real signs uh, when he was growing up. Imagine your child grows up to be a murderer. Would you still love him? Would the guilt and sense of responsibility be overwhelming? Jeffrey Dahmer's parents have struggled mightily to understand what might have gone wrong with their child. His father's search for an explanation led him to look inward, even to write a book simply titled A Father's Story. But his search may be in vain, because even the experts and profilers who've studied serial killers are baffled by why they do it. There doesn't seem to be any indication in any of the serial murderers that something external makes them want to kill. It's as if something is thrown, a switch is thrown, and they begin on the pattern of what their pattern will be. Maybe all we can do is what Lionel Dahmer did, look back and try to see what went wrong. As a young child at the beach with his parents, Jeffrey Dahmer discovered a dead crab. He examined it with a child's curiosity. But later, the curiosity grew into something unthinkable. All I know is that uh, I wanted to, to see what the insides of these animals looked like. I, I, um, there may have been some violence involved, some underlying subconscious feelings of violence. Uh, I just, it was, a, it was a compulsion. It became a compulsion. Jeffrey Dahmer got bigger, and so did his compulsion to look at the insides of living things. He began to kill them, satisfying powerful urges that he didn't understand. In ninth grade, uh, in biology class, we had uh, the usual dissection of uh, fetal pigs. And uh, I, took, I took the remains of that home and, and kept uh, the skeleton of it. And I just started branching out, uh, dogs, cats. I suppose it could have turned into a, a, a normal hobby like taxidermy, but it, it didn't, it veered off into, into this. More and more, Dahmer killed animals in the woods behind his house. He knew it was wrong, but he couldn't stop. Then at 14 or 15, it got worse. I don't know, that's, it that's became a compulsion, and it switched from animals to humans. I, I, I still don't understand it. I don't know why. If your fantasy life as a teenager includes killing, who do you tell? From uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable with anyone. And so I just uh, closed myself off and uh, just put on uh, a mask of normalcy. As Jeffrey Dahmer entered adolescence, his secrets multiplied. He began to feel attracted to other young men. It was not an issue he could talk to his father about, but Jeffrey knew he was gay. Started have, having obsessive uh, thoughts of, of uh, violence 
uh, intermingled with sex. And it just got worse and worse. Uh, I didn't know how to tell anyone about it, so I didn't. And just as Jeffrey was becoming aware of his internal violent sexual urges, his external life began to unravel. His parents' marriage, which had been rocky throughout his childhood, finally ended. He found himself alone more and more. And then one night, while his mother was away on a trip and his father newly moved into a motel down the street, a fantasy Jeffrey had been having for years came true, and the killing began. I was 18 years old, driving home. Uh, I saw this hitchhiker about a mile from my house. And he caught my eye. I drove past him, thought to myself, should I stop and pick him up or should I just keep on going? Uh, I wish I just keep on, kept on going, but I didn't. I turned around, picked him up. And uh, that's when, that's when it, the nightmare became a reality. It just, uh, it, it just seemed so bizarre to me that this obsession that I had been thinking about and wanting, just uh, all, the, all the parts are there and they, they make it possible to make it happen, just at, the, just at the time when it could happen, when there's nobody at the house for two weeks. After the first time he murdered, Dahmer says that he tried to get control of himself, and for six years he did not kill again. In 1984, he found himself living in Milwaukee, frequenting gay bars when the violent sexual urges overcame him again. I met this guy at one of the uh, bars, downtown Milwaukee bars. We went back to the hotel. Just planning on uh, getting drunk, I had put some sleeping pills in his drink to render him unconscious. And I uh, was just gonna spend the night with him. When I woke up in the morning, uh, my forearms were bruised and his chest was, was bruised and blood was coming out of his mouth. He was hanging over the side of the bed. This type of behavior and the urge that develops, it's triggered. It doesn't go in cycles. It may be a place that he's in that reminds him of something. It may be something that he hears. It may be a certain season. Uh, it may just be a color. It's intimately connected with memory and previous experiences and something that goes on at an unconscious level. Whatever it was, it came over Dahmer almost like a dream. I have no memory of beating him to death, but I must have. And that's when it, when it all started again. Uh, I had no intention of, of hurting him at all. How could Dahmer not remember? It's hard for a normal person to imagine, but Dr. Helen Morrison believes that the brain functioning of serial murderers is unique. Part of his mind is split off. Again, we have this piece of this puzzle that's somewhere that doesn't connect with the thinking part or the logical part. It's not far removed from those of us who drive every day and we drive the same route and we don't know how we got from point A to point B. We know we did it, but it doesn't enter our consciousness. Unlike other serial killers who seem to actually derive satisfaction from the killing, Jeffrey Dahmer says he did not. His motivation, his objective was sexual. He wanted to create a sexual slave that he could totally control. And to that end, he performed the most horrific of experiments on his victims, literally drilling holes in their head. I tried to uh, create uh, living zombies with uh, muriatic acid in the, in the drill, uh, but it, it never worked. No, the killing wasn't, wasn't the objective. I just wanted to have the person under my complete control uh, to do with as I wanted. Dr. Helen Morrison, who profiles these men, says part of the reason is because serial killers like Dahmer literally feel things differently than a normal person. To the serial murderer, it's very similar to the young child who may pull the legs off of a daddy long legs or a fly to see what happens. There is no humanity there. It's just, oh, this is a very interesting thing. They do things to individuals that they've never experienced themselves. They want to see pain, or they want to see fear, 
or they want to see agony. And with Dahmer, that experimenting included what had to be the most shocking part of this case. He sometimes ate his victims. An idea abhorrent to anyone with even vaguely human sensibilities. And yet here again, Dr. Morrison says that in fact, Dahmer's behavior makes a peculiar kind of psychological sense. Jeffrey Dahmer was not the only individual who was a cannibal or bit his victims or used teeth as a weapon. If you remember about infancy, if we go purely psychologically, the only way an infant interacts with his world around him is through touch, feel, and teeth. And this is a way that babies explore their world with their mouths. That's what they use. That's how they relate to the world. And what is evident in all of the serial murderers is this trait of very oral, or mouthing, or biting, or eating, ingesting, which is highly infantile, but it seems to be a way in which they can be with their victim. It, it made me feel like they were uh, a permanent part of me. Besides, besides the just mere curiosity of what it would be like, it made them feel that they were a part of me, and it, it gave me a, a sexual uh, uh, satisfaction to do that. By the late 80s, Dahmer had spiraled completely into a free fall of killing. A serial killer was on the loose in Milwaukee, but why wasn't anyone noticing? Serial killer profiler Robert Ressler says it was easy for Dahmer to hide. He was fairly good looking and uh, uh, very shy. And I think uh, I've often said that in, in any uh, college group, uh, you could put him right in the middle of uh, a college group and, and uh, probably you would look at him as a, as a decent young man. And that was Dahmer's most powerful weapon in luring his victims into his world. 17 in total, they had several traits in common. They were all men, all young, mostly minorities, and almost all were gay. Starting in 1984, one by one, these men disappeared. But nobody in Milwaukee had any idea that a serial killer was on the loose. Annie Schwartz is a crime reporter for the Waukesha Freeman newspaper in Milwaukee. It was very much business as usual before Jeffrey Dahmer was caught. Uh, because of the nature of the victims, the kinds of people that he chose, they were people that, that, for the most part, weren't missed by their families. They were often people who were tossed aside by their families because they were, uh, they were gay or they had had problems with the police. He chose his victims uh, very carefully. He chose people that wouldn't be missed. If families were not missing the victims, Jeffrey Dahmer's family was missing clues that something was terribly wrong. There were close calls, like this one with his father, Liam. I had a box in my uh, bedroom closet and uh, it, it uh, contained uh, the mummified head and, and uh, genitals of uh, a young man I met in one of the bars down in Milwaukee. And it was a locked metal box. Uh, my dad uh, one week came to visit and happened to see it and uh, he was wondering what was in it. He didn't know, nobody knew. I told him it was uh, pornography, some magazines. And we, he wasn't satisfied with that answer. We got into uh, a bit of an argument because I wouldn't open it up. He uh, took the, the locked box down to the basement and was about to uh, smash it open. But I came back in the house, we reconciled. The reconciliation with his father would mean the lies would go on and that Jeffrey Dahmer would continue to hunt down victims in the gay bars of Milwaukee and kill them. But in a city with a relatively low crime rate, why were the police not connecting the murders? Dahmer's seeming normality helped him hide his reign of terror. People like Dahmer can get away with this easier because law enforcement does not recognize him for what he is. Uh, they're looking for somebody who's dragging their knuckles on the pavement and baying at the moon with hair in their face. Uh, they're not looking for Mr. Nice Guy, the quiet young man living in the neighborhood. But there may have been something more to why the murders went unnoticed. Okay, hi. Um, this, um, I'm on 25th and State. 
And this is y'all man, he is butt naked, he has been beaten up, he is very bruised up. He can't stand, he's study fall out, he has, he is butt naked, he has no clothes on, he is really hurt. And I, you know, I ain't got no court on him, I just seen him, and he needs some where's, help. Where's he at? On 25th Estate, the corner of 25th Estate. He's just on the corner at the he, street? Yeah, he in the middle of the street, he's done a lot. We trying to help him, some people trying to help him. Okay, and he's unconscious right now? Yeah, he getting him up, but he is, uh, he is bruised up. Somebody must have jumped on him and stripped him or whatever. Yeah. The call is about this young man, Conorak Synthes in phone. The voice is that of a neighbor, Glenda Cleveland, who spotted the young man trying to escape Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment. Dahmer had already tried to perform his crude sex zombie experiment on the 14-year-old, drilling a hole in his head and pouring in acid. Drugged, bleeding, dazed, the young man had somehow managed to get away from Dahmer and yell for help. The police did come. Jeffrey Dahmer told the police that Synthesin Phone was his 19-year-old lover with whom he'd been quarreling. The police went into Dahmer's apartment, saw nothing amiss, and returned the boy. The police then radioed back to the station, joking about what they had seen. The intoxicated Asian naked male <laughs> was returned to his sober boyfriend. My partner's going to get deloused at the station. A month later, when Jeffrey Dahmer was arrested, he admitted to killing Synthesum Phone shortly after police left. The death would cost the two police officers their jobs and would force the entire city to look inward at attitudes and treatment of minorities and gays. There would be candlelight vigils and city decreed days of healing, but Jeffrey Dahmer would leave a black mark on Milwaukee. The place where Dahmer's apartment building stood was raised and uh, put a playground in, raised all kinds of money from the community, and no one in the community wanted to use this playground because they said it was the devil's playground. I think that the city of Milwaukee, at the end of the Jeffrey Dahmer case, was left with the unfortunate realization that it can happen here. It being whatever horrific thing that you see on the news that you think happens in other places and to other people. There was the sad realization for people that live in the city of Milwaukee that it could and did happen here. But of course, the deepest scars would be reserved for the victim's families and the family of the murderer. Never, Jeffrey! Jeffrey! I hate you! That is out of control! Don't with me, Jeffrey! I'll kill you! I love you! I my You took my mother's oldest grandchild from her. And for that, I can never forgive you. I hope you... I hope you can deal with what you've done. The families of Jeffrey Dahmer's victims had their day in court and an opportunity to address him. Jeffrey Dahmer sat motionless throughout. His father, Lionel, sat behind him. Jeffrey's crimes had been a terrible shock for him, so much so that for the first 24 hours after he learned of them, he didn't believe Jeffrey's confession. I just... How can you see your son who has been riding a tricycle and, and, uh, and running around with his dog, Frisky, and uh, playing tennis with me, taking a knife and cutting a person open, and then doing sexual things with it. Mm, it's pretty hard. Those who profile serial killers can understand why Lionel would have such trouble reconciling his baby boy with the adult killer who would perpetrate such sickening crimes. We do know that when puberty comes, the ages of 13, 14, 15, that the hormones seem to interact with the brain chemistry, and we have no idea what that's doing or where it's coming from. I think probably there was a, a, a mixture of feelings of anger and hate and, and disappointment and, and just, and also feeling extremely sorry for what he did, um, you know felt very sorry for victims and their families and, and, uh, and also for Jeff, the terrible waste. Both Lionel Dahmer and Joyce Flint, Jeffrey's mother, struggled to find a way to support their son in the face of his crimes, a brutal task for any parent to endure. There's thing, something or things so deeply locked up in, in his mind that uh, even he doesn't know what's going on and therefore I have to hug him 
It's almost like I don't have a right to mourn or grieve because there are all these families who will never, ever speak to their children again. By all accounts, Jeffrey Dahmer seemed to be relieved that he had been caught. He cooperated thoroughly with authorities and a battery of doctors and profilers who wanted to learn more about his behavior. What was uncontrollable about Jeffrey Dahmer was the urge. It was the urge he couldn't control. It was the craving he had to satisfy. And that's why when he killed, when he killed, he killed because he couldn't satisfy the urge any other way and had to do it immediately. And this is something Dahmer seemed to know better than anyone. At his sentencing, he read a statement of apology for his crimes. Your Honor, it is over now. This has never been a case of trying to get free. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. This was a case to tell the world that I did what I did not for reasons of hate. I hated no one. I knew I was sick or evil or both. Now I believe I was sick. I know how much harm I have caused. I tried to do the best I could after the arrest to make amends, but no matter what I did, I could not undo the terrible harm I have caused. I know I will be in prison for the rest of my life. The rest of Jeffrey Dahmer's life would last less than two years. In November of 1994, a fellow inmate of Dahmer's beat him to death. The killing occurred in a 20-minute period when the men were unguarded. Although Dahmer expressed repeated remorse for his actions, in the last interview he granted before his death, he made a stunning admission that he still had fantasies of killing. It never completely goes away. I'll uh, probably have to live with it for the rest of my life. I wish it would go away. I wish I, there was some way to completely get rid of, of the, the compulsive thoughts, the feelings. Uh, it's not nearly so bad now that there, there's no avenues to, to actually act on it. But uh, no, it never seems to go completely away.